he couldn't make it. And um, the whole part of about building business on uh, on open data is actually his game. So uh, I will do my best to deliver his information um, and uh, work through that. But basically, the goal of today is to really think about how do we stop thinking about a singular way around open data. So we've been thinking about open data. How do we, a lot of it's been transit apps, uh, visualizations. How do we stop thinking about it in the way we've always been thinking about it? How do we start thinking about giving people incentives to build businesses around open data? And then if we do have these kinds of incentives, what do you need as people who work with it, who are trying to build these businesses? What kind of structures do you need to make them happen um, and to make, and make them have impact in government? And this is where I'm gonna need your feedback. I do have a little bit of a presentation to start with. It's not on the screen because they don't have a Thunderbolt connector, and I made the silly mistake of buying a new computer recently, so it's, you know, well, but it's fine. It's not important, it's just a bunch of words on the screen. Um, just <laughs> so it's on the <laughs> So uh, we'll quickly just walk through it. So my name is Samir Vasa, I work at Mars Discovery District. If you can't hear me, give me a shout. If you have a question, interrupt me. This is informal. Um, Okay, sorry, can yeah. I interrupt? Please. Do you need to wear a mic? Yes, you do. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, I put pockets. This up here. Pockets might be tricky. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, I think I have a pocket in my ear. Is that okay? Is that yeah. Right. Okay, and just kind of feel important all of a sudden. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> sorry, I was like, I was just going to show you. So, you, what is the place you work with? I'm just getting into that. <laughs> all right. So again, uh, my name is Samir. I work at Mars Discovery District. We are a uh, Convergence Innovation Center, which doesn't say much to most people. Um, we are at the corner of College University, and we are an organization and a building that kind of tries to bridge the worlds between academia, government, finance, business, um, and the, the burgeoning innovators in our community in Ontario who want to say that we have ideas for business um, that could also do social good, but we don't actually know how to turn them into reality. So we get people who come in with medical technology, uh, med te medical technology imaging with clean tech, energy storage, energy distribution innovations, and they're all smart people who have really great ideas, but don't actually know how to set up a board, get seed capital, seed funding, get venture capital funding. Who people who aren't really used to building business around their really great ideas, they come to Mars and we help them do that. My role at Mars is on a team of, called Data Catalyst. Our job is to look at how data now can be a resource for building these kinds of businesses and innovations as well. We've been doing some research over time, and we found that open data. Oh man! Can you speak loudly, please? Oh, you got to move to the front. This is this is not a presentation. We're going to talk, so you have to move to the front. <laughs> please, yes, we're getting friendly. Um, please move to the front. So we've been looking at some research around how open data can actually be used to build these businesses, but not just businesses that are you know uh, an application, but also have some serious social impact. And in part of our research, one of the things that we found is, first of all, right now, people are building businesses, uh, sorry, are releasing open data for a few things. One of them is transparency. Uh, governments are releasing open data because they say that if we release the data, we're transparent, people can know what we're doing, that's great. The other one is accountability. And uh, they're saying, by giving people data, we're able to let them hold us accountable for things that we do. Well, that's great. I think at the start, when people were talking about open data, this whole idea of transparency and accountability was important but perhaps hasn't translated well to where we are right now. Where transparency and accountability isn't enough in time of fiscal restraint, in times of innovation where government isn't able to keep up pace with the pace of innovation. We're also in a place where nowadays when people, you don't need to see it, this is my speaking notes. No, no. <laughs> it's also transparency, yeah. accountability, it could back you down. Ah. We're getting to that right now. <laughs> well played. Sorry, Piero, right? Yeah. So yeah, contracting out. And we found that right now when government asks people to engage with open data, one of the struggles we have is that they say build us an app or create a visualization. Uh, there are things going across all uh, across the country starting next week uh, called the Great Canadian Appathon, which is great. It's a really good way for the federal government to say, please engage with us and our data. But framing it as an appathon, it says, please put it on my phone and then, well, forget about it. So what the question is, how do we move beyond this whole idea of build us an app? Because apps are great, but they're not always good businesses. And how do we actually start thinking about open data as a way to engage people as translators? What we find right now is that open data makes sense to people in this room, makes people, sense to people who work in open data, but to the average Joe Schmo, to my brother who works as a supply chain manager, he doesn't care about open data. He's like, tell me why it's important to me. Tell me what I can do with it. 
So we need to engage a group of translators, people in this room, people who use the technology, people who understand the technology, people who understand the data, to translate these into services that are scalable and sustainable. In order for those translators to exist, we need to give them incentives. So it's one thing for me to tell the community, and we have a great open data community. In fact, they're all hacking in the room next door. So please go and drop by and see what kinds of things you can help, what problems you can help solve. But you, can, you have a whole bunch of open data, and a lot of people are interested in it. But how do you maintain that interest beyond simply, I'm an engaged citizen and I really want to help? Because a lot of times, engaged citizens that really want to help may not have the skills, and the engaged citizens that really may not want to help may not have the resources to do this as much as they should because they have to have real jobs. So how do we create incentives? And the two big incentives we found are money, which is probably the largest incentive, and social good. If you're able to demonstrate to people that what they're doing is actually having an impact, whether it's on policies or service delivery, that's great. If you're also able to show that they're making money, that's even better. Uh, which one defines the greater motivator? Money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we all kind of like to I, it's just a reality, right? Like, I love the fact that the work I do helps people do better work. So there's social impact, social good. But in the end, if it didn't pay for my rent, right. I wouldn't be doing it, right? So uh, I think mo money's a motivator just because of the reality that we're in. So if we're using open data to start building these businesses, and money's a big motivator, and social impact is a big motivator, how do we, how do we make sure that these businesses, these we stop thinking about these businesses as applications or visualizations, and we start thinking of them as solutions. A lot of times we get caught in this kind of, what, what can I build? What is a product rather than what is a service that I'm creating out of this data? And so we're going to get into, I'm going to go through a couple of examples around that. And we also have to start thinking about these sol solutions. I'm going to repeat these words all the time as sustainable and scalable. I want to give a hat tip to Adam Schwab, who's not here, but who created one of the first transit apps for the city of Toronto using their open data transit site. It was incredible. It was, it's still my favorite transit app. I can't use it anymore because he stopped supporting it. Why? Because it wasn't sustainable financially and it wasn't scalable. So he couldn't take it and say, well, I can also do this for San Francisco and I can also do this for other places because standards didn't exist. Just the business operating mechanisms didn't exist for him to scale it. If you can't scale and you can't sustain, all of these things will fail. It's the, it's the honest truth. So we need to start thinking about outside of applications as solutions and services, but we also need to keep the other two words that were two S words, which are sustainable and scalable, on the table. So the big example that I want to give is how many of you uh, checked the weather this morning before you came out, uh, other than looking out the window? Did some of you turn on the weather network or use your weather network app or go on their website at all? Mm -hmm. That business is an open data business. Most people don't realize that. But 20 years ago, the US government said, hey, we've got a bunch of meteorological data. We use it. It doesn't make sense for us to start a television channel called the Weather Network or create websites and tell people whether or not to wear a jacket today, because that's not the business of government. The business of government is to collect this data and use it effectively for forecasting and things like that. But for service delivery, for telling people whether or not they should put on a jacket today, someone else should be able to do that. They opened up that data set. All the meteorological data in the US is now open. That is a 10 billion dollar industry in the United States. Ten billion dollar industry. That's a sustainable and scalable business solution, right? And that's the kind of example that we can do. There's a whole lot of other open data sets that we can use. The other example I want to give around that is GPS data. GPS data, when we think about it, is usually on our TomTom -tom or on our Google Maps trying to get around in our cars. But GPS data is actually a 90 billion dollar industry globally. Again, sustainable, scalable, 90 billion dollars over the past 10 years because a lot of it is being used in nautical navigation. And nautical navigation is not actually because of an app on their phone, but it's used to plan routes, it's used to plan shipping, it's used to plan um, supply chain routes, and these are all sustainable solutions that we don't think of when we necessarily think of open data. We think, oh, we can build an app to tell us how to get there, rather than thinking about building algorithms, building business intelligence to figure out how to, <laughs> to move goods more effectively on the waters. So $90 billion of business is created by opening up GPS data and opening route data um, in the shipping industry. It's massive. So those are two examples. You've got weather, you've got GPS. What else can we do? How else can we do this? Um, in order to do this, we need the support of government. I'm really excited that there are people from government in the room here, whether that's municipal, provincial, or federal. But you need a larger interest in the private sector. Uh, because right now we haven't found financial incentives, the private sector has been mostly disengaged. But if we're able to establish those incentives, and very shortly we'll talk about what those incentives could be, we can start talking about how private sector and government can turn into unlikely friends and become best friends. So what can you do about this? Uh, I'm going to give four examples of spaces that we can play um, and really look at kind of how, how do we break out of the app mold in these spaces and really think about what kinds of businesses are we building, what solutions. Mm -hmm. 
The first is transportation. When I think about transportation data, what's the first thing that comes to mind? TTC. Oh, TTC. It, it's Google Maps. It's the transit apps, right? Yeah. And that's easy transportation data. How about if we start thinking about what's, what's off your phone? What if the chance, there was a chance to put some kind of GPS on every bike? What if there was a chance to put every, some kind of GPS on every car? In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, they're already tracking your movements in your car. There's just no aggregated way of finding out what everyone's doing. New York City did an example where they were able to take cabs. They would put GPS transponders in every single cab in New York. They ran this experiment for six months. They watched the traffic flow of cabs. And then they gave it to a private company and said, based on this, how would you change the way we move traffic in this city? This private company built a business around analyzing data sets, turning it into business intelligence, which then translated into urban planning, or should translate into urban planning. The reports have gone into New York. They haven't been implemented yet. But there's this opportunity where we can start thinking, transportation data is more than just how do I get from point A to point B. But it's business intelligence around how we plan cities, how people access food, how we make sure that people get nutrition. Transportation data, if used effectively, can now be used by business to start delivering goods and services to people in ways that they haven't done before. Another place is around the budget. And I know there was Better Budget TO, uh, Alex and I, but Gabe is here and he was definitely one of the people that was instrumental in Better Budget TO. And they were really looking at how do you take a budget and make it understandable for people. There's one opportunity here, is to not only make it understandable to citizens, and this might seem heretical, so Gabe, scream at me, but how do you also, also make the budget understandable for people who are going to pitch the government for vendor services? If you take the budget and say, we can create dashboards of how budgets are spent, but not only how budgets are spent, but how those decisions are made, and the decisions officially are made through a rubric that can be quantified as data. If these people match this, and the data says that these are the kinds of vendors that get approved, how do you change government procurement? How do you increase economic growth for companies, small startups, small to medium-sized uh, enterprises, who can say, I was never in the running for a government contract before because I didn't know how, or I didn't think I fit the mold, but now that the data says that I can, I can start bidding on these things. I know where I can go. We're changing the way that we deliver service to the government, and the government requires service as well. It's one example of budget. That's another business that we can build that's outside the app world. Um, Sorry, I just mint. Um, markets. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is that California, one of the things that they've done in, in around the job market, the labor market, and just generally kind of how uh, the economy works in the state, is that they opened up a whole bunch of labor market data and gave it to the Center for Jobs and the Economy, which is a not-for-profit, and said, have fun with it. And what they were able to do is they were able to create a dashboard, which now lets employers see, A, what kinds of people are being hired and fired in a certain state or a certain location or a certain board. What kinds of skills do they have? And what kinds of gaps do they have as well? So now educators, businesses who deliver education and training are able to say, I'm gonna use this open data to target my, my services better around training. Uh, companies from abroad are able to say, hey, I know that there's skills in this, or I know that there's an employment gap here, but I also know that there's a lot of infrastructure spending and tax breaks in this area. I'm going to bring my business to California in this area and build it there. That didn't exist before. California's done a really great job of opening this up all the way to the point to saying this company fired this many people on this date, and they did it longitudinally over 25 years. You're now able to make massive economic planning benefit there, but also incentivize businesses to come into places that they, again, didn't know where they could come in. Open data allows them to do that. And then, uh, and I can send links to all of these if you guys are interested afterwards. Uh, and then my pet project, uh, the one I love most, is healthcare. How do we make healthcare better? Uh, do any of you wear a Fitbit or a Jawbone Up or anything like that? I know Randy does because we're competing in walking. <laughs> you got me this week. But uh, <laughs> there's a ton of. In fact, um, did any of you go to Andre's talk just uh, just before this? Yeah. Around yeah. That, so you can probably fill in here. Kind of you can hack your body to collect really e excellent data and then do interesting things with it. There's a great story about a guy who had type two diabetes and was able to just like tracking every single macronutrient that he, he consumed, but also kind of the activities he did, found out how he was able to not just manage his diabetes, but get rid of his type 2 diabetes wow. because of the way he was tracking. Again, I can send that out. I was in the New Yorker a little while ago. Um, that's, that's the power of data in healthcare. Now, that's great. That's Again, I keep going back. That's an app. That's maybe a hardware solution and an app. But what are the other things we can do in healthcare? And here's what I posit is, do any of you deal with people who have chronic care conditions, who have to see a bunch of different doctors at a time? Mm -hmm. Are any of them out of town? And here's, here's what I'm gonna say. Uh, I have a friend whose mom has to who has spinal issues, and she has to come into Toronto, because she lives in Windsor, to see four different specialists, two surgeons, and get three or four different types of tests every month. 
In order to do that, she spends three weeks a month planning that. She has to pick up phones, faxes, all of this stuff, making sure that she can somehow pack them all into a two-day window at the same time. There is a business in the United States that says, hey, if doctors were able to give us our schedule, just their scheduling data, not who they schedule, how, just their systems, we could actually create systems to say, this person needs to visit these things once a month, these things every six weeks, these things every two months, and actually get, book those appointments into the doctors and specialists and test labs, but also take them and say, give it back to the, per the person who needs the care and say, did you remember to do this before that? Did you remember to create the, to take these tests before that? Don't forget, three weeks from now, you have to go and take this test. You have to pass before that. That's simple scheduling data. It's not healthcare data. It's not our own health records. There's no privacy enabling problems in there. It's data scheduling data that you can give to someone that not just completely changes the way they access healthcare and hopefully changes the way that our healthcare system reacts to them, but can create considerable efficiencies in the system, saving, the mo saving money for the Ministry of Health as well and for practitioners everywhere. Just scheduling data. There's so many other opportunities where we can go away from the app. <coughs> Fitbit's great, but we'll go away from the, just the Fitbit and we'll start thinking about how we change the healthcare system. The Heritage Health Price, have any of you heard of it? No. Uh, Heritage Health, they're an insurance company in the United States, and they said, hey, we're going to open up in an anonymized and de-identified way um, all of our transactions that we've processed through everyone that has our insurance. And you're going to tell us who the next person to be admitted to the hospital is, how many times they're going to be admitted, and how, many times, how much money we should budget for the next year for hospitalizations. Opened up that data set, said go nuts. They had over 26,000 different entries, they gave a $3 million prize. That open data set has now led them to create over $15 million in efficiencies in processing how they're gonna, gonna forecast for healthcare. The great thing is the winner of that wasn't a healthcare practitioner, it wasn't someone who understood the health system. It was a team of a financial analyst at a big investment firm and a computer programmer who works uh, on like supply chain management. So basically, they have no healthcare industry knowledge, but they were able to come and say, based on your data, I'm able to create efficiencies. Now, they won $3 million. What if the, the Ministry of Health was able to say, help us create efficiencies in the way we appropriate our money across the healthcare system, and we will pay you as a consulting service to do this. This is another business that we can build that also creates social impact because we're saving the Ministry of Health a lot of, uh, a lot of money, but also creating better healthcare outcomes for Ontario. <coughs> I'm gonna say the same thing around energy. Uh, and this is another pet project of mine. And if any of you realize that you have a smart meter on your house, mm -hmm. uh, do you know where the data on your smart meter goes? Okay. All you think, all, well, you would assume it's going to your hydro company. And what do you get out of it? You get a time of use billing. Do you know that there's enough data in there that not just tell you how much you have to pay, but tell you what you're using your energy on, how, how much you're using, how you can conserve, all of that stuff is being collected. It's going to a large repository called the MDMR, and nobody does anything. What is MDMR? Uh, meter Data Management Repository. Um, it's, a, it's a big database, essentially, that the Ontario government holds. It has all your smart meter data, and it's all de-identified, and then it's given back to the utilities saying, this is what they use in aggregate, give them time of use billing. What, what would happen if you had access to that information? What could you do with it? Could you create a system, a smart home that says, hey, did you know that you're using a whole lot of heating, but if you close this window, and if you started using this, this kind of electric, uh, electrical outlet less, we can save you this money, increase your, uh, decrease your heating bill, all of these kinds of things. You can integrate it with water, with electricity, with heating. How do we all of a sudden start creating homes and services and solutions for people who want to manage the way that they live and their energy consumption? Now, the great thing is that system exists. Uh, we launched it last year. It's called the Green Button. Ask your utility about it. It's in 10 utilities around the province right now. We recently got the Ontario Energy Board to say, you must do it to every single utility in Ontario. It gives consumers the right to their own data, which is shocking, because you didn't have it before. But now you can say in a programmatic way, instead of saying, just tell me what I'm spending, it's saying, give it to this company, give it to this startup, give it to this person who's able to analyze it and tell me what to do with it. And now companies have come up, Energent, uh, Zero Footprint, who are creating solutions and services, are making money from you giving them their, your energy data and them telling you how you can conserve better. The great thing about it is you save money, they make money, the Ministry of Energy doesn't have to spend $30 million in their conservation programming anymore, and they can do it to build better infrastructure or something like that. So again, they're building business, building economic growth, creating social impact just because of flow of data. There's so many other things we can do in the energy space, that's just one example. Yeah? 
So if I call on from Ottawa, so if I call Hydro Ottawa and say, give me my green button data, so like, I'm going to tell you that give them three months because they're not on board right now. <laughs> but hopefully they will be on board by the end of the summer. Hopefully when I do call, what do they say? You don't even have to call them. You can go on the website and say, share my data with this provider. So find a solution that's going to help you, or you can download it yourself, and you'll get it in a standards compliant way that will come, back, come down as a download. Awesome. If you're a zero footprint user, I'll give you an example, Project Neutral. Any of you live in the Junction or in Leslieville? Yeah. So Project Neutral um, had this kind of, uh, or was it Riverside or Leslieville? I'm not sure. But they had a competition between neighborhoods, and they said, we're going to increase conservation in these neighborhoods by creating games and programs and community events around conservation but what we require is for everyone to give us their login credentials for Toronto Hydro. If you give someone your login credentials for Toronto Hydro, you're essentially giving them all your billing information, you're giving them your credit card information. Now, I trust Project Neutral, I gave them my, my login credentials, but now with the green button, Project Neutral say, can say, don't give us your login credentials, just go to your Toronto Hydro site and say, share with Project Neutral, check, I give you authority. Now Project Neutral can build services across the province, because it's one standard, and they don't have to build it for every utility, to start creating these conservation programs that are not just online, but they're actually community <coughs> events. They're education programs in schools that allow conservation to happen across the province in an easy way. Uh, just then, as an aside, just conceptually then, it's yeah. not that much different than an open login. For example, I use Twitter to log into some other website as an authorization to allow something to happen. Indeed. So that's an easier way to explain it to the wider public. That's a great way. In fact, the, the way we've actually been telling it to utilities has been saying, do you do your banking on Mint? And a lot of them say, yeah, of course, I give Mint so I can get a budget. Well, it's the same thing. You're letting Mint have access to your bank records. Um, and you're saying, you're going to your bank and say, get, share that with them. And you can control how much you share, and you can revoke it at any time. The green button's the same thing. The green button's not the only energy stuff. There are a lot of kind of building energy things that we can start thinking about infrastructure. One of the examples is that I talked to RBC recently, and they said, what if I was able to get users to share their energy consumption data when they're going to apply for a new mortgage, or if they want to do new retrofits to their house, and they want to put in a solar panel, and they need a loan to do it. What if they were able to share their energy use with you? They said, we can create a whole new mortgage industry around energy use mortgages. That could be a potentially billion dollar industry right there, around insurance, around mortgage. These kinds of things that, again, we don't necessarily think of as open data businesses because they're not app-based, but they're things that we need to start thinking about if we really want to start scaling these. The final thing I want to talk about is meta. Uh, I've skipped a whole bunch of things. Uh, metadata, um, there are businesses that make a ton of money trying to figure out how to understand data. And right now, with open data, this is probably where the biggest, biggest goal is. Is that if you're able to take data and say, this data makes sense with other data, and we will link those two, we can create a business out of that linkage. Just data that connects other data, there's businesses to be created out of that. Uh, out of that. GovLab, right now from NYU, is doing a survey of companies that require open data to stay afloat. Um, so they're calling it the Open Data 500. They have 500 businesses, of which more than half of them do nothing but link data. And these are businesses that are financially viable, some of them publicly traded, who without open data would not have a business. So there's already precedent for this. We have the opportunity to start building those in Ontario. Can you give an example of a LinkedIn business? Uh, yeah, I mean, Google is a, is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jose, do you have an example? Yes, there's a, there's a Canadian company, and the only thing they did are aggregators. Mm -hmm. uh, they aggregate uh, contributions to charities okay. from organizations, banks, corporations, and they use large contributions to, to charities. And then they sell that information, they do all the BI analysis, and they sell the information to charities. So they can target their, uh, their fundraising strategies. That's why I get all those calls. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's again, it's kind of like that, that middle layer, that translator layer. A charity may not have the expertise in-house to be able to say who should we be targeting for fundraising, but they're being able to build a business around that translation layer is again, breaking out of that app economy and start thinking about solutions and services that you're providing to others that are scalable and uh, sustainable. Jose, please. Sorry, this is just one thing. I love it. We, we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's an example that's one of my favorite examples. As it's from Australia, and it's this company who took uh, the GPS from uh, freight, from trucks, moving merchandise from one town to the other, and they built a, a formula to use that information to uh, predict GPA, uh, GDP growth on a per town basis on real time. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and they, they, the data is open, 
they were very smart and their, their formula is proprietary. Mm -hmm. They immediately copyrighted the, the, <laughs> the algorithm that they're using, but they're selling that data to every single business uh, and the government and a bunch of people. So if you want to know business, you can know how GP is, is changing from a wealth to kitchener to that, that kind of level. So now this uh, whole business intelligence and analytics kind of market is massive and massively growing. And it's, it's again, one of the things we found is that in Canada, it's still a bit of a gap. There, those don't exist. So a lot of times what we're doing is finding companies outside of Canada, perhaps in Australia and the U.S. to, to do these kinds of things. Well, you can give examples of companies in the existing data. Mm -hmm. And it's one where it was called today, if you release this data, so what the better models on either side of that or the existing well, so this is why, and I think I think one of one of the great things that the governments, at least in Ontario and and Toronto here, and increasingly in other municipalities across the country, are doing is instead of starting releasing data um, just willy nilly, they are going to say they're going to people who are going to use it. They're reaching out to entrepreneurs, innovators, <coughs> big business, and saying, "What data do you need to do your business better, and what does that provide back to us?" So again, I'm going to go back to Jose, um, whose group ran uh, these things called Ideas Camps across the province. So they're trying to figure out what open data to release for the government in Ontario, and they said, okay, instead of just saying, we're going to release everything, or we're going to release this, we're going to go to people who are actually going to use it, say, what do you need from us? What formats do you need it in? And then what's going to come out of it? And then, you know, follow up with them to say, if things are coming out of it that are going to be a benefit to the government, how do we actually build upon those and build them into our processes and workflows as well? Now, that's a, it's, it's a burgeoning process. It's just starting, but I mean, it's... I think that's where we need to start thinking about this. There needs to be a better communication between people providing data and the people that are using it. And right now, they're they're both siloed away and assume that the that they that there will be some connection, but there's there's very little connection happening right now. It's, it's starting. So, please. I was to say I think that's smart because um, if you talk to Kim Silk, who is the information mm -hmm. professional at the yeah. Martin Prosperity yeah. Institute at the University of Toronto, she says you know asking. Governments just release data, organizations just release data, you're going to get a lot of um, mishmash of stuff that's not standardized and it's hard to put, you know, compare apples and oranges. Um, whereas if you can standardize it somehow, get it in a format, then you can work with it better. So. Yeah, no, that's great. I, uh, it's, it, my, my big thing is what's the most, one of the most popular data sets in Ontario is baby names. And I, I, I find it fascinating because the public loves it, um, but I haven't found a single entrepreneur or someone that's turning it into a business. So what, what is the best? I mean, is there, they probably could, but what is the value? I and mean, maybe we do. And now we have another example. <laughs> Sorry, it's just that there, there, there are thousands of pages. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it might be advertising. But, but yeah. No, but I mean, I think I think I think it's 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 important to start also like not just saying, hey, government, give us this so we can build a business, but the government to say, we this exists. So here, here's how we can help you do something. I don't know what that is with baby names, but I mean, it's just the example that kind of it's it's these weird data sets that exist. But where's the value? We need to start figuring that out. That's so, uh, an obvious one. I mean, link, link the, the names of David with the names of the like you know, the most successful. Right? We'll groom your child. Yeah, having this question of point, do you think that the the evolution of um, the data that we want access to opening up is based upon kind of a need? So you brought up healthcare and access to healthcare records. There's standards now that didn't exist before to exchange healthcare records, right. and I think uh, in the body hacking session there was points made about uh, Sunnybrook is sharing uh, tests and records yeah. with their patients more proactively now. So do you think? Things that we don't have now will come as the need comes, or I hope so. <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist, but I mean, does anyone work in healthcare and data that might be able to talk to them? Okay. So there's work to be done there. <laughs> Actually, there's Question. not. There's not because listen to what she says. How do we? How, I have a question or a concern. You know, people will go to different hospitals in different parts of the cities for different reasons. Right? They'll go to their neighborhood hospital, and then they'll go to a specialty hospital like a Sunnybrook. How? Or when will it ever be? Well, when will it ever occur that I can go to any hospital in Ontario and not just have the records from that hospital, 
but all the hospitals, because it's really frustrating to go and when yeah, and not, I, can, I, can, I can jump in. That's that's currently what I'm working on right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Why are you what have you done here? Yeah. I'm working on yeah. it. <laughs> you can ask my chart to reference a physician, say, in Red Bell or other physicians. So it's starting this year. Sure. So, 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 I mean, you can do that. Yeah, but, but my dad can't look at his records anyway. My my biggest frustration when I came here, oh, just uh, resident as resident in Canada, just three years ago, is that before I was living in Holland, I got there. I went to my family doctor. He asked me where do you want the prescription, which pharmacy. And he's saying there. <coughs> I went it, uh, I needed to go to the hospital and uh, gave me the copy and say, we book. Then, before uh, I, I was going, I was reaching home, the, the, the hospital for me, do you, can you make the appointment at this day, this day, and so on? Everything was electronic. I went to the dentist, they want to change the dentist. My uh, radiography went transmitted to the other one. And are all right. Okay. Okay. I think you already had something to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that down the uh, U.S. the U.S. Veterans Affairs. I forget what the color of the button. The blue button. The yeah. blue button. Yeah. Right. The, but so any veteran, when they have a, a health issue, can go into any hospital and uh, or doctor or clinic or what have you, and they have uh, uh, access to all their records. Doesn't matter wherever they are around the world, actually. That's what we need here. And just to jump in, actually, one of the things that we're working, we're working with the Presidential Innovation Fellow there um, to see how you can roll it out, not just across the U.S., but maybe bring it in Ontario and Canada mm -hmm. as well. So different healthcare environments, so there's different kinds of privacy and connections that we need to worry about, particularly around billing and how, how you manage uh, your practitioners and making sure that they have ownership over the relationship. But it's something that we're working on. If you're interested in that, come talk to me because I haven't figured it out yet and I need help. So, um, but Chris, please. Um, so... This notion of um, interoperability of data, mm -hmm. I think, is, is a very important discussion, whether it's healthcare or anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I recognize there's politics and process and camps and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, if you look at it at the grassroots level, especially with hospitals, and you probably know this better than I do, um, all the hospitals, many of the hospitals use Meditech, yeah. which is an yeah. information system. And Meditech has very little interest in, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while since I've, <coughs> I've been exposed to this. They have very little interest in, in allowing Meditech systems to cross connect with each other and share information, which gets to the problem of if, if they're not interested and they don't even care about HL7 or any other interoperability standards, then we got a problem uh, until they're dis destroyed out of the market or disrupted, right? And so I argue that that problem is easily fixed if we provide the right incentives. And so right now we've been thinking about legislative and regulatory incentives for this. How about we start thinking about business incentives, right? How do we say, if you make it interoperable, you're actually going to increase business. Your, va your value is going to increase. How do we make that sale to them? Again, I don't know yet. But if we're able to say to all these providers saying, if you follow HL7 or something like that, and that's just a healthcare standard for those who don't know. Um, this is how your business is going to get better, then also we don't need to make the, the regulatory case because people are going to be incentivized to do it um, through the kind of big dollar side, right? Yeah. That's, that's a big one. Um, I want to add a, an observation and a different question sure. from the other side. We all may know an individual who had to take care of a chronic family member or somebody in the hospital, and because of the churn of the doctors, the specialists, the nurses, they actually become the most knowledgeable person person so they actually in a way are a walking open data app collection human app whatever you want to call that how do we use that fact that we have these individuals who become subject matter experts perhaps you know globally on a very specific medical issue right. uh, as you're talking about healthcare and that's been going for the last few minutes how does that become open data? Should it be open? 
Right. We're talking about the illness. We're not talking about the individual. Right. Guarantee they won't be sued <laughs> to start. Yeah. That's a yeah. real question. Yeah, that, that kind of ties into what's and how do we incentivize them to actually to do, to want to do that as well because they've got other things going on as well. So, I mean, that's a great question. If anyone has anything to respond to that, is kind of the statistics all being data? Stats can? Yeah, they they have some open data. They have a lot of data you have to pay for. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of data you have to pay for. Um, but again, like one of the things is that we, if you can make the incentive to them to say, we can increase service delivery, we can create efficiencies in the system if you release this by giving it to these people whose business is to do better service delivery, uh, then you can tell, then stats can, can, it's easier for them to make a case because it all comes down to the bottom line to say, yeah, we should open it up because it's actually gonna make, make it better, not just for its citizens, but for our business, our line of business. The, the, the wait times are uh, uh, average. Wait times, wait times are public. Yeah, a lot of the, the position. Oh, I don't know. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, no. Just whether they're. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's there's a lot of things that again, like this could be solved by someone who could build these kinds of tools yeah. if they have access to that data. So how do we help them get access, and then how do we make sure that they're able to build a sustainable business out of it that can roll out? So. There's a lot of privacy issues that are involved with healthcare data, and since you're extraordinarily smart, <laughs> can, can you maybe tell us a bit more about the Privacy Commission in Ontario and what she's done with privacy by design, access by design, and introduce that subject matter a little bit better? Yeah, uh, complicated, I, but I recommend just going to her website. She has seven principles for privacy by design and seven principles for access by design. And if you try and distill it all into one kind of overarching statement is the consumer should have control over their own data, with caveats around it, <laughs> um, and nothing should be identifiable. And so if you can bring everything down to that point, then the privacy issues kind of, I don't want to say disappear, but they're mitigated in a, certain, in a certain case. The problem we have right now is that we're dealing with systems that were created, and now we're looking at open data, and those systems don't have these kind of privacy mechanisms built into them. And in healthcare, again, you'll understand this, it's, it's the hardest one, because we're dealing with legacy systems that are really hard to change at this point. Uh, if we're starting, and this is again, if innovators, entrepreneurs, people are coming in and saying, we're going to create new solutions, if they embed principles around privacy and access from the start of the creation of their solutions, then these make these make a lot, these are a lot easier to overcome. Uh, I would let the Privacy Commissioner opine more in depth on these kinds of things. I, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm the right person. Actually, Yuri, you're an you're a Access by Design Ambassador. Do you want to? Want to say something about that? <laughs> well, to your point, you know, it's it's not something that you can distill in in like 30 seconds or something. I, as you said, I would encourage people to go to the, the site and and. But one thing I think that is important is that what what the, Dr. Kabuki and the commissioner has has said is she is all about open. Okay, she has always uh, maintained that really really important. Uh, you know, for the benefit of citizens and society at large. Uh, with the caveat around the privacy, you know, and uh, I think the the one thing that's becoming more, uh, I, th I think, interesting is that the, the mood of citizens is changing somewhat uh, from a privacy point of view. So, uh, you know, if if we felt comfortable providing information about our our health that was not, uh, you know, anonymously so that we could aggregate all of this information and do analytics, you know, on a geographic area, on a, uh, on a d disease level area. And there's been some of that sharing where people are sharing their experiences, uh, you know, that have diseases. So I think that whole area in the healthcare is, is opening up uh, and there are certainly opportunities uh, and in, in Europe and in other parts of the world, there's something called living labs, uh, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with and that's, that's something that has an awful lot of opportunity uh, around utilizing personal data, but making, you know, aggregating it and creating a lot of intelligence that's beneficial to all of us. And I, I just want to go back, as we're building this kind of case for business around open data, a lot of people say, oh, privacy issues, you can't do it. Yeah. So we can't build a business. And I, I, I keep telling people when they say that, I say that it's actually not privacy that's the issue. It's a perception of privacy that's the issue. Privacy is rarely an issue in around a lot of these things. Uh, it's people feel like you can't have my information, I don't want to give you my information even though they've already given it. Um, so how do, we, how do we create value for a citizen so that they stop thinking of privacy? And the big example is 
if you are a Google Now user, for some of you that might be, it's a little strange, but like, you know, before your flight, Google Now will say, hey, I saw your email about a flight. I know you're leaving in three hours. Your flight's delayed. I'm going to call your, ho do you want to call your hotel to tell them you're coming in late? It's, it's weird because you're like, well, why do you know so much about me? But you don't think about it because it's, sure, call my hotel, let them know I'm going to be late. I provided val they've provided value to me. In return, I've given up a bit of my private information um, to Google in order to be, I said, scan my email box so you can tell me these kinds of things. What's the trade-off? So how can we say, by giving the government, or by allowing the government to use the information it already collects about you, how, do, how can they provide value to you? And a lot of times that value is through giving it in an aggregate way to people who are able to create business intelligence around it. Mm -hmm. so, that's great. I, we've got like two minutes, if anyone has any kind of final thoughts, things. No? All right, well, I, oh yes, please. Is, is anyone doing that practitioner schedule? I, I, I spoke to someone in the U.S. who is interested in building that, but currently none of the systems exist for them to do it. So they are working with three, if I'm not mistaken, doctor's offices and specialists um, in New Mexico and trying to do it with those three. But again, because there's no standardization and nothing's open, uh, they can't. But I would love, if, so, if someone has kind of some sway in the Ministry of Health, <laughs> you know, just be like, it's an easy win. It's a quick win, and there's companies that are willing to jump on that, and it'll provide so much value. And again, it's new business for Ontario. Fair enough. <laughs> in Canada, health in Kuwait. And but there, but there are opportunities, and I mean, these are the kinds of things that if we start as as people who work in business or who are ex interested in creating these businesses, start asking the right questions, saying, "Hey, does this exist?" And you start asking two practitioners, you start asking two decision makers. All of a sudden, there's an incentive for them to say, "Oh, a lot of people are interested in this." And I can see the value in it. So there was a company in Montreal called Tungo. Yeah, yeah, Tungo. It got acquired by Blockchain by Rim. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, worked in the lab. Yeah. He had a great schedule. Yeah. yeah. There's a Toronto. There's a Toronto startup. I believe they've changed their name now to Open Care. Okay. Um, they're trying to solve that issue, but with private. Hmm. health. So you know, when you book your dentist appointment, things okay. like that, in terms of finding. Um, efficiencies between opportunities for the the healthcare provider and you know pairing them with individuals who need to book themselves into various places. So and there's a U.S. company as well. I can't remember their name. Another startup that's attempting that from that perspective. But it'd be interesting to how do you get you know these practitioners and hospitals to now plug into that. So here's my sales pitch to all of you. If you're interested, if you are building these kinds of businesses, whether it's in healthcare or elsewhere, or you know people that are, uh, come talk to me and I want to help you do it. Um, in fact, that's my job, to help you do it. Um, and so if it has social impact and it's going to help make you money and increase economic growth, I'm here to help. Uh, and sadly, that is our time, but feel free to come approach me at any point. And thank you so much. Thanks. I would just like to add one thing what you yeah. said real quick. If you want to build it today, <laughs> come to the hackathon in the Transmedia Room where there's a whole bunch of hackers and thinkers and people who are actually building things right now. So, great. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. He's, he gets smarter every day. <laughs>